Now I will leave the floor to Igor, Igor Jurgens, mm. who will uh, give us an highlight of what's going on in the Russian Russia. Federation. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. <clears throat> thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm from the educational institution, so I'll be talking about more of our programs of educating people for the sustainable development, energy, and environment rather than uh, practical things. But before starting my presentation, I would like to say that <clears throat> after Paris Peace, uh, Paris uh, Climate Summit, uh, Russia committed itself to global zero, I mean, to uh, net zero by 2060. Yeah? Uh, it adopted its uh, national plan and so on and so forth. But you can uh, appreciate that that was a formidable task to accomplish because 60% of the uh, external trade of Russia are carbons. 40% of the revenues to the budget are this oil, gas, and, and coal. And 20% of the GDP. So to cut this, to scrap this, essentially, <clears throat> is uh, the task of the restructuring of the whole economy. You add to this steel industry, agriculture and everything else, which is also uh, he heavily carbonized. And you can imagine that from now to 2060, uh, the task is, is uh, enormous. And uh, that was, as I said, Paris Peace Forum, for, again, excuse me for Peace Forum, but that was also, the, the, they coincided, uh, Climate uh, Forum and Peace Forum uh, in Paris. Uh, uh, the business. Surprisingly enough, in spite of all the sanctions, in spite of all the pressure on Russian businesses and private and, and uh, public, uh, they build up an ESG alliance of the 30 uh, uh, largest companies and they work hard on this non-financial reporting, on this green uh, uh, instruments, on uh, trying to clean themselves up in accordance with sustainable development criteria. And uh, I can tell you that in most of uh, those companies, you can see a pretty sensible plan of decarbonization and uh, uh, the fight against greenwashing. Uh, I, would, I would like to reiterate one thing, that the restructuring of Russian economy of the, of, of the scale, which depended so much on, on, on the carbons, would need uh, uh, extra efforts. And the plan which was worked out for the future is uh, this exactly the production of hydrogen, uh, uh, green and blue uh, hydrogen, uh, both for the domestic purposes and for the, for the since this uh, issue was, was mentioned, uh, for the export. Uh, on the island of uh, Franz Josef, that's on the extreme north of Russian Federation, they started production of this hydrogen and they played with the idea, to the best of my knowledge, of using uh, North Stream 2 as the uh, pipeline which would uh, pump hydrogen to, to Germany. Uh, they were at the experimental change with both mixture and non-mixture of with diesel as, as, as it was mentioned. And uh, they, they really, they really uh, before the, the, the crisis, before the, the, the start of this tragic war, they, they really played with this idea. But we, we know what happened to, to Nord Stream. And, but uh, the, the, if I understand correctly, the technology exists. And uh, Russia has to uh, start renewables from scratch, actually. We had such a cheap gas and cheap oil and cheap coal that we never thought about that. But the prerequisites are all there, I would say, because <clears throat> on solar, uh, I don't know whether you know or not, uh, Yakutia, which is the extreme north of Russia, uh, Yakutia, which is, has minus 40 degrees uh, in, in winter, uh, has more solar days than, than France, for example. It's, it's a pretty solar area. Winds, no problem at all. And water, of course, is, is, is available. And from this point of view, 20% uh, of the world production of hydrogen, that was the target for, for the Russian Federation according to this decarbonization plan. Uh, 
renewables, wind, solar, all of this at the moment is no more than 2%, I think, of the, of the balance. But people start doing all these uh, pilot projects, uh, big parks, and, and uh, uh, surprisingly enough, especially younger generation, which thinks about Russia after. Russia after this crisis, which we which we lived through, uh, they are very much uh, uh, sort of involved and uh, very very enthusiastic about that stuff. I mentioned ESG alliance, but we have also uh, uh, different initiatives, including coalition for the sustainable development of Russia. A big organization, young people, bright eyes. Uh, you know, in spite of everything else, they they fight for their causes. And we in GIMO, in Mayo University, uh, together with the UNESCO people, we, we organized the GIMO ranking of Russian regions in the achievement of sustainable development goals. That's for the second consecutive year. Uh, it's, it's difficult to see who is, uh, who is where, but the top three is Moscow, Belgorod, and Murmansk. And the, uh, the worst uh, three uh, are those areas which are run down, which uh, the GDP, uh, regional GDP, of, uh, the, the lowest. So the uh, <clears throat> interlinkage between poverty and, and richness is obvious in sustainable development uh, like everybody else in Russia. Uh, what we did uh, for, the, uh, for those young people, we organized so-called Priority 2030, which is uh, subsidized by the state. Uh, this is a federal academic leadership program, and uh, MGIMO is, is in the center, as you see, but uh, you, uh, uh, Rostov, that's uh, Southern University, uh, South, uh, Southern Federal University of Russia, they are dealing with agricultural aspects of sustainable development in uh, uh, raising temperatures in the south of the country and in the Caucasus. And uh, St. Petersburg University, in coalition with us, is dealing with the uh, Arctic area and uh, with the uh, hydraulic, uh, hydraulic aspects of uh, uh, the development of the permafrost and, uh, and, and all of that stuff. Uh, Russian position on the COP27 was that uh, gas is a transit energy and nuclear is a green. And we, we keep thinking that this, this, is, this is a fact of life. Uh, we, we try to develop both methodology, technology and science in this field. In spite of all the difficulties, uh, Rosatom builds some good stations in, in, in Egypt and some other countries. Uh, we, academia in, in the nuclear field is working hard on this um, uh, uh, mini reactors in, in nuclear reactors and on the uh, waste disposal and reprocessing. And they advanced pretty, pretty, pretty well. If you look at the uh, research in the United States on, on, on the same subject of nuclear mini and of nuclear waste disposals, and in Russia, you feel that the, the people go in the same direction with more or less the same speed. So we have our advantages. At the moment, these advantages can be discarded for the rest of the world because we are under sanctions, and rightly so, because the alternative to the sanctions would be a war. War is worse than, than sanctions. But the time will come when Russia will come back to the civilized world uh, with its own ideas on the general balance of energy and, and uh, with some, some, some results. Believe us that uh, there are people who think about future in my country regardless. Thank you. Many thanks, Igor, for your comments and uh, honest uh, presentation. Friedbert. Well, well, Igor, I think that we all hope that this will come soon. Uh, I mean, Russia is there, will remain there. It is a huge country, uh, and uh, as you said, it has uh, many, many uh, people who were not in favor of the war and who had great projects. I had a project with, with my company, with uh, Wolfgang Schüssel and Anatoly Chubais, 
uh, for uh, greening Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know that uh, with Rosatom, I had a, a contract on uh, how to deal, how to treat uh, nuclear used fuels in a way which is called transmutation and partition. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, and that is the tragic of this war, all this got killed. All this wonderful cooperation got killed. And now it's a, I mean, we just heard uh, Franklin Savant Schreiber. It is European companies who have to do that. Uh, Rosatom was in lead, but, but now others are coming in Europe uh, with, with, yeah. uh, with we should, great we, we speed. We should think about and, no, some no, no, academic. But, but, but yeah. it's, mm. it's, the, the, the point is not who is first and the competition. What is important is really to take nuclear, a new generation of nuclear, as a green uh, uh, as a green energy source. Uh, and that is possible in the moment we understand that there is a chance to get rid of large parts of this uh, uh, nuclear fuels. Uh, and there are technologies in the world. And uh, I think we should be much more open than the uh, green movement uh, all over Europe is today to nuclear. With the exception of France, perhaps, but uh, in general, there is uh, still uh, a lot of, of skepticism, and I think we have to overcome that in the new generation. Thank you, Friedberg. Uh, Igor, you want to you. reply yeah, to Friedberg? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we started. Uh, Wolfgang Schussel from Austria, uh, ex-Chancellor, uh, Anatoly Chubais from Russia. He was a special representative of the President Putin for the sustainable development. I was involved also. I know that your organization, where well, we met in Munich, etc., uh, etc. Et so it was very good. Essentially, I don't know, I'm not an, an, an engineer, but essentially if we talk about this nuclear thing, they, uh, they produce uh, uranium, then what is wasted, they sort of, a, uh, they made the particles which can be reused again, and then the waste goes to the 150 meters depth where uranium was found. That is to say, he's reproducing himself in the soil. It's, it's simply said, but very difficultly done. But we and Americans, we do the same thing. And in Pennsylvania, I know the, the laboratory which, which does it more or less the same thing. So it's, it's, it's a great misfortune what happened, a historical mistake. But uh, let, let's hope that uh, it will be over in, in the foreseeable future and we go back to normal. Thank you, Igor. Uh, Narendra, yes, please. Just a small uh, brief question. You talked about mini reactors. Could you elaborate, are the mini reactors being talked about at development in Russia are different from smart reactors being talked about in the US and Western part of the world? Uh, probably it's the, the, the different name for the same thing, but uh, you create a reactor which can take care of the uh, village of uh, 500 uh, houses something like that. They install it and that they, they go ahead. Whether it's called smart or mini, I don't know, but uh, in Russia we call it mini. Probably it's called uh, smart in the United States. Sorry, please, when you speak, when you push on the button, who, sir, yes, please. Sorry, that's kind of my field, and I'm a great admirer of the Russian effort in nuclear. I would like to state that Russia is so essential to the nuclear world in Europe and in America that it is not under sanction. Rosatom is not under sanction. It's so essential. And what happened in Russia for small modular reactor, it's not really called smart, it's small modular reactors, similar, but is for heat. Uh, they put it on a barge, and it's uh, so difficult to build in the you know, far north of uh, Siberia that uh, they put it on a barge, and then they drove it during the summer, and it delivers heat. Uh, and in fact, you know, that's probably the best use of nuclear power, is to deliver heat, which is 50% of our energy consumption. Everybody talks about electricity, but in fact, we should talk about heat, and nuclear is the best for that. Thanks. 
thank you for your insightful comment. Other question? Just, please, sir. Yes, uh, many has been said about production of energy, but probably we need to also to talk about the consumption side. You mentioned about heat and, of course, electricity and uh, transportations. And the, the point about the demand side is they are very difficult to change because it's related with household, you know, small enterprises, people in the village, and so forth. So I, I wonder if, you know, all the panelists could maybe share how we see that, how we see the, the changing and how we should do uh, in terms of the demand side uh, of the energy. How should we direct uh, the changes to becoming more renewable? If you may, if I may. Yes, please. Because it's, um, so energy demand uh, is something on which we, we work a lot and actually a good uh, solution to that, and coming back to your, to your point, it's high energy prices. That's uh, so far the best way we have found to make people care about energy and suddenly try to decrease their consumption. So we, we've been doing a lot of projects where we were trying you know, to deploy apps, advice, whatever, for energy retailers so that people uh, share best practice and reduce their energy consumption. But uh, we, we see recently that the best lever actually for people to, um, to, to, to reduce their energy demand is actually that the, the, the price is high and that they suddenly have to manage their, efficient, their energy very efficiently. Likewise, on the B2B side, we have an, 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 as consultants an, a huge number of requests from our clients who suddenly are trying to be much more efficient and sober in energy and ask us to revise completely their industrial processes to deploy a lot of captors, sensors, IoT, whatever, to uh, as well reduce their energy demand or optimize it, to try to reduce a bit or to optimize a bit their bills. Uh, so there is an increase in the, all the technology around uh, energy uh, efficiency. And the latest uh, topic, it's uh, corporate PPA. There is an increasing uh, demand for uh, green energy. Uh, and it was at first for to reach uh, targets on climate change, renewable energy uh, commitments that a lot of companies have taken. But a lot of players are also seeing this as a way to have part of their energy bill control because when you sign a corporate PPA, you sign it for 10, 15 or 20 years and you have a, a, a clearer view of the future electricity price or, uh, or gas price of this corporate PPA. Thank you for your comment. Just before I give you the floor, I just want to to make a comment on, uh, on what you said. Uh, when we're talking about reducing demand, again, it's a northern uh, conversation. Uh, if we think of the South, there are billions of people that don't have access to energy, don't have access to electricity. Uh, in South Africa, two hours a day, they are in blackout, in, and many, many examples like this. So we have to be careful uh, if, if we want to live in a better world, we have to increase our production of uh, energy and electricity. That's the topic. Uh, for sure, in Europe, we, have, uh, we live in the context that we are now, but we have uh, to be careful of the conversation globally, just to mention. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah, sir, you have the floor. No, you just take my word of our ah, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, but that comes back to the point. I agree with you. That's, a clearly, uh, that's clearly a northern uh, perspective. But coming back to your point, uh, not working on energy efficiency in Europe leads us to import energy and derive it from where it should land in other continents. So I think it's, uh, we should not oppose North and South. It's a, it's a global perspective. Uh, keep in mind that energy access is clearly a topic in most part of the world. And I want to add something and make a comment on what you said. Yes, it is a Northern uh, conversation, but we have to be careful that uh, the energy demand that uh, Okay, it's decreasing, but uh, be careful of uh, the economy and recession. That could be the, the consequences as well. So we have to be careful on this uh, wording as well. Sir, you want to make uh, to add something? 
Yes, that, that's actually more my, my field, and I think you're absolutely spot on, um, because I think when we're talking about the energy transition, I think that the, probably the biggest, I'm not going to say fallacy, but probably the, the hidden spot is that we've all focused on energy production. The reality is that this, this transition means that we're having more distributed and intermittent energy, and this means that we need to manage the grid, and it comes back to Mr. Appert's point, we need to manage the grid, and when I say the grid, it's not only transportation, but it's distribution and low voltage. And to your point, and it's not a north or south issue, it's the market design and the way we run energy that needs to be thought, thought all over again very differently. Because if you're in a village, for example, and I've done a project like that in Africa, in Tanzania, if you're in a village, building a microgrid is much more complicated than we think and much more complicated than just saying, okay, we put a generation unit here and we distribute and someone consumes. Because you need to manage the consumption to be able to manage your, your grid to, to avoid having failures on your, on your grid. I think you have a very spot on point on this uh, element of demand. Thanks for the com uh, comment. Yes, comment. please, yes. you have the floor. Yeah, I, I learned from experience, Indonesia is an island's country. We have more than 15,000 islands. And grid is out of the questions for many of our, our islands. And so I think back to the, our colleagues from India, decentralization of uh, energy in terms of energy production as well as energy consumption is essential. And probably listen, you know, listening to all of you, probably I can just imagine one islands in Indonesia, we will jump from uh, using wood, maybe directly to the mini nuclear uh, technology. You know, just, just, you know, imagining things because again, that is something that really need to, to, to put on the perspective. Of course, probably I'm still dreaming, but, but probably that is the way. And I would add uh, natural gas as well. You have a lot of uh, projects in how Southeast Asia and on floating LNG, which are very important. Yeah. If I take the example of the Philippines in your country, that's, that's an important topic. We haven't uh, spoken about natural gas, but its role in the energy transition and access to electricity is essential, yeah. especially in your countries. Yeah. Other, yes, please. Uh, just uh, two quick points. Um, you see, when we talk of conservation, there are two sides of conservation. One is, of course, what we can do in terms of true conservation, like in India we did uh, re only recently. I mean, the LED bulbs are supposed to be, you know, helping in conservation of power. So the government came out with an initiative which was initially subsidized across the country, and the government was buying literally billions of bulbs and just passing on to the, to the, to the, to the consumers. Uh, subsidized heavily, and that really helped us change. A, the pattern, B, the habit, and three, of course, you know, the overall power consumption. So LED bulbs, and today India is kind of a leader in LED bulbs, of course, you know. But at the, there is other side of conservation. I mean, there are three billion energy poor on the planet. Three billion. There are one billion energy poor just between Afghanistan and Burma. A majority of them, of course, in India. What do I mean by energy poor? The people who have very limited access to electricity, maybe one bulb, a mobile charger, maybe a small portable or small television set, and, and they spend half of their evening switch off half the world. When they move from one room to another, the family makes sure that they've you know, switched that off and the family is all assembled in one room. In the, to save electricity, you know, because they can't afford the bill. Like in India, is power surplus today. We are installed capacity is 400,000 megawatt. So we call ourselves power surplus. Yet, we have 700 million people who are energy poor because they don't have means, money to pay for it. Now, so that's the situation. Power surplus on paper, but with 700 million energy poor because they don't have money, paying capacity. So, I mean, that's the dilemma. And how do, for instance, it's like telling somebody who actually has access to only two pieces of bread, saying, conserve bread. Come on, I'm getting only two pieces. So what do I conserve? 
So this, I think, is extremely offensive to even, even talk about it for those three billion people on, on the planet. Uh, the same, for instance, when I earlier talked about LNG, a ship going to Bangladesh mm -hmm. and being diverted. Yeah, sure. So you see the, and I, there was an argument given by one of the energy ministers from this part of the world saying that, oh, that's not a worry. We have got long-term contracts, LNG contracts, and 80% of LNG globally is actually shipped through these contracts. I said, fine. And I was in a conversation with the Honorable Minister. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that these contracts are not Bible law or anything. These can be renegotiated. And we have seen Qatar. Four years ago, when the LNG prices dropped, China insisted and Qatar agreed to renegotiate a 15-year-old, 15-year-long contract. China pushed the pressure. Qatar agreed. You know what happened after that? We sent a delegation to Doha. And we asked for the same thing. Initially, they said no, but they agreed. You see, and this, this 80% kind of LNG global supply is through the contract to say that these are sacrosanct, mm -hmm. these are Bible, you can't be reopened. They can be reopened. Yeah. If Germany, France, or Europe, or the North pays more money to an LNG exporting country, of mm -hmm. course, by all means, mm -hmm. they'll be renegotiated. The price will be also renegotiated. Mm -hmm. That's the danger. That's where the question is of governance, mm -hmm. and that's where the uh, question of you know uh, uh, ethics. Just the last point on nuclear. You see, the I mean, India. Uh, the when I look at India's energy mix, the share of nuclear power is two percent, and we have been working on nuclear power like since we were born as an independent country in 1947. We set up the you know a commission for nuclear power already one year before the independence, but it's still the share is only two percent. And we, we collaborate with Russia. We have our own initiative, including one on thorium, based on thorium. That's fast breeder reactor based on thorium. We are working on it. We have got a small one already. And now we, we are also buying from France. We are watching, buying, you know, 10,000 megawatt nuclear farm kind of thing, you know, from Westinghouse in the US and so on and so forth. Yet, there are many challenges. You see the fuel and uh, nuclear waste and so on and so forth. So nuclear is probably future. That's how I also look at it. I think 2060 and beyond, uh, many of us won't be around. But, uh, so, but 2060 and beyond is all going to be about nuclear power, one way or another. Why and how? Because my sense is that nuclear by that time would become, for instance, more affordable, and those, all these complexities probably would have been history. And then solar power would be probably the, you know, commercially more viable, easy to operate. There might be a few questions like my friend talked about the mini grades or distributed solar. Distributed solar in India is also a huge challenge. We have done very well in solar the last five years, but it's mainly power we generate and goes into the grid. We are still struggling when it comes to distributed, including mini, mini uh, you know, uh, grids. But my sense is that 2060 and beyond in the global energy mix, uh, nuclear is going to occupy substantial share Solar, depends how you look at it. We can always, for the sake of fun, I can say that solar power is also nuclear power because sun is a nuclear reactor. So that's also indirectly nuclear power coming, a reactor created by nature. And thirdly, of course, hydrogen. But hydrogen, like some of my colleagues pointed out, in India, there is a lot of these hype these days on, 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 on uh, uh, you know, with regard to uh, hydrogen and especially green hydrogen, I'm not yet buying into it. But even if, on, let's say, it becomes a huge success, I think in the global energy mix, hydrogen share is probably not going to be more than 10%, but I may be wrong. I can't, I'm no, no expert on that. But overall picture when it comes to this, I think looks, if we move in that kind of direction, chances are we'll be able to eradicate energy poverty, and there would be more energy prosperity around the world. Thank you, sir. I leave you the floor, and then we move on to the last speaker, uh, Marc Antoine. Yes, please. Oh, yes, sorry, but Narendra's remark on uh, uh, nuclear as a long-term energy is interesting, with the perspective that, if I remember well, uh, Europe uh, so far in its taxonomy considers both gas and nuclear as transition energies. Absolutely right.